Are you a leader in customer success, pre-sales, professional services, support? Do you work behind the scenes and roll up your sleeves to make sure that customers are happy? Renew. Then this is for you. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Getting it done. Services, success, and software. We'll talk with the pros that have been in the trenches, getting service teams off the ground, launching new types of groups to service customers, or running agencies that don't have a product attached to it. For the pros, by the pros. This is the GSD Podcast, and this is your host, Jeff Kushmerick. Hey there, it's Jeff. Just a quick note. Um, I know my vocals are a little distorted at the beginning of this podcast. Um, good news is I rarely talk during this. Um, my mic level is just jacked up for some bizarre reason. And um, But David uh, spreads gold. And as I said, he, he's really uh, taking over the podcast here in a great way. So uh, you might hear a little distortion when I first start talking, but uh, just bear with it the first minute or two. And and then let David do all the rest because uh, he's a great guest. And we really went into uh, some really deep topics about um, CS ops and when to do it and how to start and what stacks people are using and using uh, CSM sentiment versus using strict data and just some, some great approaches. So uh, give it a whirl and uh, I'll fix that mic for next time and I'll talk to you later. Bye. Computer. All right, and I think we are good to go. So, I've been sitting here talking with David Apple and catching up. Uh, this is a note we had met during a, a game grow retain. So, right? GGR, yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, it should be retain. That's a good thing for them to have. You know, no affiliation except for uh, I've done a couple of hostings, and it's just a great networking thing. and. Also, just great for people to to log into and ask questions and things like that. So it doesn't matter where you are in your sort of CS journey there. But you know, as I mentioned, and, and if anybody heard the, the previous podcast, I felt like I crawled under a rock or crawled out from the rock that I was under <laughs> in the last couple of months, and I just saw like CS ops is just blowing up and it's everywhere. Where where my kids who are getting ready to go to college, I'm like, well, may, maybe you need to start learning about this stuff and did actually we can chat about that but i am pushing them into the data like you don't have to be a data scientist but you should be able to understand data and everything like that so so i i talked about this with with dana a little bit in the last podcast if you heard that where we were talking about what we used to do back in the day before this was like a term and, and all that stuff and then i thought the good sort of bookend on that would be talking to david who's just just a ninja on this and just a, a lovely saying i'm also going to post a, a linkedin post which i think he just does an excellent job talking about you know all of this stuff from the ground level uh, and things like that so david welcome well let's uh let's let's chat about where you are and, and kind of how you got there yeah hey jeff thanks for having me currently i am the manager of customer success operations yeah. at red canary we are a security operations shop, so it's good to be uh, working in operations for an operations company. I've been I've been here with the team for coming up on eight years now. It's very hard to believe. Eight years at the SaaS company. Oh my God, that's yeah. No one stays eight years. You know, they took good care of me, and that's awesome. it's still it's still interesting and and fun. And and I've done a lot of different things as a very early employee. And as you know all too well when you're when you're an early employee you do lots of things and so everything keeps, <laughs> uh, that's right keeps the work life interesting I mean, so vacuuming the floor is it one of my stuff i was like hey somebody's gotta do this so. yeah you name it we've done it like uh, the roll up your shirt sleeves and get it done kind of work like removing yeah. hailstones from a patio out in denver uh, yeah. or uh, an office party to like, everything <laughs> right we've done it all yep um but that's probably one of the reasons I've stuck around. Like, I I think that in CS and in, especially in CS ops, curiosity and, and being you know 
explorative by by nature is one of those things that helps you out and, and i think i'm sort of naturally inclined to do those sorts of things and at red canary they've really allowed me to do a lot of different stuff over time which yeah. is which has kept me very busy but uh very excited to continue to explore cs and cs operations specifically now yeah. because uh it's just there's so much to do and so much to learn yeah. at this point That's that cool. uh it's, it's enough to keep me busy for a very, it's very long time. Right? It's new ground, right? <laughs> did you start off originally in just CS and then moved into CS Ops, or did you come in from like an operations perspective and then moved into into CS? Yeah, actually neither. Yeah, it's a crazy, well, I don't know if it's crazy, but it is a story. A friend of mine once described career trajectories in two different ways. One was one was the uh, paint by numbers career, and one was the connect the dots career. Yeah. And I have never had a paint by numbers career because I'm, I'm always I'm all over the place. Absolutely. <laughs> I've always been the, the kid who, when you ask him, when you ask him what he wants to be when he grows up, I, I start to get anxious and nervous because I don't I don't have any idea. There's no you know. There's too many things to explore and do. So uh, I actually came to Red Canary after after a previous full career in the federal government working for the Department of Defense as an analyst. Yeah, I almost 14 years there and I and I took the jump. My wife and I were at a point in an hour and you know with our family that we we both needed to change and we found a great outlet back close to our parents in Central Virginia to sort yep. of you know, do some of that work but Red Canary was starting up at the time, and they were a security company that needed some people power. Yeah. And one of their one of their big um, early on ideas was that if they could if they could take someone who didn't have a security background and really you know good in analysis or not, but yeah. then really focus them on the most important things within an environment, teach them what bad stuff looks like they could then take that and scale it and and, wow. and do something really cool with it. And so I was the first guinea pig along yeah. those lines. And since, you know, since then that, that whole model is more all for like really good and important ways, but that's what I did for like nearly two years or a little bit longer even than that was I sat side by side with with one of the best security guys on the planet. And I had no idea at the time, you know, like basically- yeah, That's just something coming from the DOD. <laughs> by the way, my mom was DOD out of MIT, Lincoln Labs. And so I'm familiar with that lifestyle and travel restrictions and <laughs> neighbors getting asked questions and stuff like that. So yeah, that's great. Totally, yeah. It, yeah, it's frustrating not being able to talk about your work with <laughs> anybody that you want to talk about it with. Unless you're an but, introvert. Yeah. Unless you're an introvert, then it's great, right? So yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, I did that for a couple of years, and as the company grew, that role mor morphed into a customer-facing role. We we started doing work that people would kind of classify as technical account management. Okay. So, talking to customers, making sure they understood what our value prop was, how the product worked, how our services worked, and then getting them to a good spot. And I found that I really enjoyed that, and and it sort of like led me down another path of of you know what my career might morph into with this strange you know company yeah. that was at the time very early did that for a while and and as we grew we had a first head of sales come in to the company and we were just sort of cresting the 100 customer mark maybe 150 customer mark at that time and the paperwork around renewals, expansions, upsells, all of that mm -hmm. stuff started to get cumbersome to the technical account managers. Like, if you know those folks, they're just not. They yeah. Want to do that, right? And just, just, and, um, just so if people under just for time frame. What years are we talking around? Is this like 2012, 2015? You gotta pull up LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm pulling up LinkedIn now. So it's the company was founded in 14. Okay. So if you just look at the the LinkedIn profile. I can tell you exactly. So around 16, 17, yeah. I started working on account management full yep. time. And it was still a customer facing role the way we did it. I had these great relationships that I built with customers as a TAM. And it was just a, it was an easy transition for me to start talking about like more of the business side of things mm -hmm. with those customers over time. And it started as like a, 
you know, documents kind of heavy role, but then it morphed into something else. It was, it was more about like, where do you want to go with Red Canary and what, what do you want to do with our services and how does that help you get to the next level? Taking, taking the, the TAM work that we had done and then combining that with more of the business and the, and the high level visibility kind of stuff, which as everybody probably listening to this understands at this point, you know, that that's what a customer success person does. So I, I started following all these people on LinkedIn talking about customer success. And one day I just went to one of our founders and said, Hey, we're doing customer success. We should just call it customer success. Exactly. And I think it's where his exact words were, congratulations. Now you're our first CSM. So <laughs> that's how I became a CSM. And, and we scaled as most CS teams do over the first couple of years. We, we, you know, roll up our sleeves and got busy. We did a lot of trial and error kind of work. We didn't have any specific tools or anything to get us started or busy. Uh, we just dug in and we worked, we worked hard. We were, yep. we had over, you know, hundred accounts a piece at that time. And we were hustling very, very hard. And we just started adding body after body. And through that, we built a team. I became the director. We started putting structure around it and mm -hmm. process. At some point we said, you know what? Let's get out of spreadsheets. Let's get a real tool. We brought in a tool, implemented that, okay. and the team started to look like a real team over over time. I fast forward a couple of years because I know this is running long, but no, no, this is all good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we got to a point where, as as one of the original folks on that team, looking around, I started to notice things like we got a lot of technical debt. Uh, with respect to how we want to run our business on the, on the customer success side. And we've got a lot of process debt as well. So CSMs early on, especially are, are doing what they do and they're creating processes. As they go finding best fit and, and what works for them. Nothing was sort of pulling the thread together across the board and, yeah. and telling that story. And it really hurt us at the, the C level within the right. company. We weren't well understood. We, we couldn't use the same language and, and represent the work that we were contributing to the overall book of business based on the same numbers that the sales right. team were using, because that's well understood. You know, people right. are doing that for a hundred years. And at the same time, we had this, this smaller department that was making big waves internally and doing some really cool stuff, working in an agile way and, and bringing really new thought and leadership to internal Red Canary, and that was our RevOps team. Mm -hmm. And speaking with our, our VP of RevOps, I, hey, there's this thing called customer success operations that sort of fits in with the sales operations and marketing operations that you have under your wing. And it seems like that would be a really interesting place to explore. And she was like, yeah, let's, let's figure this out and let's do it. So uh, I made that transition over. I've been here for a little over a year now. And, yeah. you know, I think earlier this week, Nick Meta Gainsight just said CS Ops in 2022, everybody's got to have it. So I feel like- Oh man, I, was, well, I think I might've told you that's what start, spurred my initial CS Ops research because I guess Nick's just really loving it these days because he posted in like December, November, like when I get asked by startup founders, what's what the first hire should be, it's going to be CS Ops, which, if, and let me tell you, if I tell any of my customers that, they're going to show me the door. But like, well, it's it's nice it's, it's nice when you, you you can do that. But it's super important. I'm not throwing shade at all. But it's it it sometimes you do have to go in and build a little bit of process and you know, it, it have, you know the traditional thing I see is startups. They get some money, they start building a product, they get some more money, they start marketing it and selling it. And then they're like, oh, well, crap, what do we do now? We need to service this. And then they get initially just throw some CSMs in and they're doing everything post-sale. And then it needs to sell and, you know, settle and gel a little bit. I always call this like the Pangea moment where the supercontinents break up and they start going off into their things like CS ops and implementation and things like that. So, you know, there is a sort of place around in between series A and series B. I think that it's great to happen. So absolutely. So not absolutely. Like it, if you can get it in early and that's great. More companies are getting bigger A and B rounds. So it's easier to do now for smaller companies. So I agree. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't I don't think that there's any one solution for any company out there. You know, Wayne McCullough says the same thing, like operations. He, you know, his book recently came out on seven pillars, which is which is foundational as far as I'm concerned. Oh, okay. We'll put that on the list. Uh, that, yeah. that's on the list I, I saw in the other one that you posted, which is like a textbook. 
So uh, that's 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 on my Amazon uh, wish list. Well, not wish list. It's in my cart right now. So yeah, absolutely. Nice. Put those links in the yeah. podcast notes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. Like, there's so many great references out there. Like, just you could spend all your time yeah. uh, gathering references and sort of reading about it. But like, I, I don't know that there's any magical like formula for when and how. Yeah. But what I what I feel like it. it is that coming from a CS background into CS ops within the same company as the first CS ops hire, yep. it's probably going to make your life a lot easier than it would be to sort of parachute in as an ops oh, yeah. uh, specialist and, and try to do work with an environment that Absolutely. you don't necessarily get all the way. But you know, yeah. every company's different, right? Absolutely. Hey, so let's get into it. We had some questions and, you know, I had some questions after in your blog post and then, you know, I posted into some CSM uh, or CS specific uh, slacks. A lot of alliteration there, so hope I didn't trip over that too bad. But, uh, and, and so you had this concept of, you know, telemetry, you have this sort of overall concept of customer risk forecasting, which I, I see that as being a new job title in 2022 or 2023. But, you have this concept of telemetry and you know, these qualitative customer factors that can help understand churn and risk and everything, which is probably like a, a big part of your job right now. Can you sort of expand into that? And maybe maybe with the eye of the, different than what the CSM is doing for the, all the relationship stuff, like where these kind of factors come in. Yeah, I, and I think it, okay, so a little bit of background. So where, where the term telemetry comes from, back back when I was a DOD guy working for working in Intel, one of one of the things that I did was look at rocket telemetry and sort of figure out like what you know what we knew about rocket based yeah. on the technical feed coming from that specific rocket. So the pitch, the yaw, the thrust, yeah. what the color of the plume was, etc. Right. That was my first interaction with the word telemetry, and that was my understanding of it for a long time. And it, and it varied slightly, like you can, satellites have telemetry, anything that moves, right? You can pick up telemetry on, and you can do it at distance. We moved into, I moved personally into the cybersecurity realm, and all of a sudden it started to be endpoint telemetry. Okay. So all of the actions that or people are taking uh, on their desktops, laptops, mobile machines, et cetera, produce evidence of those actions and it's as you might imagine uh, a huge data problem because every single thing that you do records and it builds up over time and you can imagine an organization having you know thousand people millions of actions on a daily basis we're talking gigabytes terabytes of yeah, it's just telemetry that you can sort of sort through right and so that was the, really the red canary problem to solve like how do you collect all of that how do you take that and discern what's bad inside and then only tell your customers about the certain things they need to know about so that they can go and act on that rather than giving them every little thing, this might be bad, this might be bad, this might be bad. Yep. And so that was my life for a few years. <laughs> and and as I moved over into into customer success, it, it dawned on me that, that CSMs are doing this inside their head on a daily basis and they're utilizing what they know about their product and what success looks like in their product and for their customers to, to figure quantitatively how or qualitatively rather how people are, are faring along their mm -hmm. customer journey but even more so these days they're starting to look at quantitative data as well like what is Jeff doing on our website when he visits what is he what is he doing in our app how long is he staying is he is he utilizing the right pieces of that that we think will make him successful based on what we know about Jeff, right? Right. And so the idea about customer telemetry from the post was that you could take both the qualitative and the quantitative and you could put them together and, and have your data set. And then CS Ops then writes the detection logic that goes through all of that data and says, if you see a combination of X, Y, and Z, that is likely to present you with a risk come renewal time or at least probably somebody that you should talk to because they may not be getting everything that they could out of our products and services. Right. And right. so in my in my head, like that is is a very clear <laughs> analogy yeah. to how we work in cybersecurity. And so I thought that was an interesting sort of way yeah. to look at it. And, and yeah. that's where telemetry from customer telemetry from my perspective 
kind of came from. But I think you asked specifically about the qualitative stuff. And, right. And, well, you know, it's, it's, I'm really interested. So I have a bunch of customers when you're doing exactly what you're talking about, where they, they, they balance out their customer risk score based on these factors. And there's a, there's a heavier weighting on the CSM sentiment. So just sort of seeing how that all sort of boils together, which is, you know, CSM being like, I don't know, I don't have a good feeling about this. And then like going into the data, like proactive versus reactive and, and all these types of approaches and everything. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk about that. Let's unpack that a little bit. So like, I think there's a big difference between like a health score and an indicator and a warning that something is wrong. The health score, like you said, has this combination of factors. It's almost a meta detector at some yeah. level, if you want to say that, right? And, and I do still feel like there's a good place for customer success manager sentiment within that health score. Of all the, the instrumentation that you can add, me sitting on this call, staring you eye to eye, looking at your facial expressions because we're via Zoom, like it's even better for face to face, but like, yeah. I can just pick up on those subtle cues that are going to tell me that this is either going well or it's not, and then start to back out from there what I think is going to happen. And the more people at that customer level that you can have that sort of relationship with, the better and more accurate that that's, that piece of your health score will be. Now, I also think that in order to make it very good over time, I think it's a, it's a big part of your health score, but to it sort of increase its validity over time, it gets better when CSMs experience having to make a call with respect to a prediction in terms of a renewal or a forecast. Yep. And the closer that they get to doing that in the way that our sales teams have done it for years and years and years, the better that they are at doing that. And so I've seen this firsthand. Yep. We, we used to not have any way to uh, predict a renewal or an expansion or an upsell other than kind of like you know, you lick your thumb and stick it into the air and see which way the wind's blowing that day. And we've gone through the whole motion of yes or no versus quantifying the percentage with which you think that you have confidence in that. And then talking about that week over week and making sure that it's accurate and updated. And that discipline around that forecast is incredibly important from my perspective mm -hmm. to getting that piece of CSM sentiment accurate within right. the health score. Right. So, do, you, do you feel that is that is something that's always there? It, it's 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 just like like a stock tracker, and it's just always collecting data and giving you the response. Or is it something that a CSM should be looking at on a monthly, quarterly, weekly basis, or something like that? Yeah, I think that the machine can tell you what's always happening. Yeah. And I think that you as a as an individual need to consider your book of business and where it is and it's and it's like, you know, renewal path, its journey and what you're doing in order to like update that frequently. And and you know, it's it's only natural that you will raise risk, you will say that there's a problem and then there will be much attention given to you and your thoughts about that problem over the yeah. next you know weeks or months until it resolves or goes away yeah so the big thing i see in, in sort of the difference in in size of companies is is being able to you know instrument your product that you're having your customers use so that you can get this data how important is this you know is can you do anything besides CSM sentiment until your product is instrumented like this. So you've got usage and then we can talk about products after that. And, you know, but let's just talk about straight up data collection for now. And then maybe lots of VLOOKUPs and, you know, tools like Tableau and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I think, I think you can ease your way into it for sure. Like when we started it, we started with a Google form and a, and a spreadsheet. Wow. And I think that's the way most companies probably want to start. You always want to prove out, from my perspective, what you know you're trying to get out of that tool before you ever even enter into conversations about should we buy it or not. And, mm -hmm. and that's honestly the best way to do it. But but you have CS sentiment, and you can record that over time, and you can correlate that very easily in a spreadsheet to to time and date. And if you overlay that on customer journey, you can start to see patterns about you know, the ebbs and flows of that CSM sentiment and maybe start to derive 
insights in terms of what your customer journey is feeling like over time to customers from their perspective. You can also just ask them. That's also super important, uh, especially when you're early on. But but things like who attended who attended your sync meetings, how like what you know what their role is, what they're trying to get out of it, all of that stuff sort of bridges the gap between qualitative and quantitative. Mm -hmm. And it's just a heavier lift early on from the CSM's perspective yeah. to enter in those sorts of things than it is uh, to be much later. Later, you want you want uh, qualitative, you want the machine to take care of all of the quantitative stuff and just the CSM to put the gravy on top of the qualitative. But like, I guess frequency of meeting, how many people, how deep you are within that relationship. Guys like Ziv Pellet, at AppFlyer, AppsFlyer have done amazing work at documenting how to build a quantitative relationship model. Wow. And he's doing it and he's doing it out of Salesforce. So we're not talking like CSM specific software here. There's there's lots of different ways you could do it. And he, he started in spreadsheets as well. So I think that there to answer your question, there's absolutely a lot of things that you can do without having a, a specific tool that's built to collect that information and having your whole app instrumented front to back. By the, you know, on the other side of the coin, anybody who is good on the data side will tell you, you can absolutely have your, have your application instrumented completely and not know what the heck to do with all of that data. Absolutely. And it's almost more paralyzing to have that situation. Yeah. So, so that's one, you know, one in the tick box for, caution to before you jump into that sort of thing yeah just the, the the thing and we you know wasn't on our things to talk about but like i could see this being extremely powerful for like your long-term sales where people are demoing the product off and you know you're, you're having to go through like a super long sales cycle and so you're, you're kind of putting this tool set into like sales engineers and things like that and sometimes people will bring in csms and into the into the pre-sales process as well but i, I think of these you know, six month long extended trials and things like that, where you're able to really say like, you know, these people aren't logging in or they're not using these modules, they're not doing X, they're not doing Y, let's make sure we get some education out to them and things like that. So, are you seeing yeah, any absolutely. of that in your travels? Uh, I'm sure you work in some Slack channels that I'm not in, so. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, like I said before, I think that this is the time of experimentation across the board, whether it's yeah. CS or specifically the CS ops, I think people are doing all kinds of crazy things and some of them will will shake out and be amazing over time and others will just be trials that we put aside for us i know our cses our our, our, our pre-sales engineers are, are much more focused on things like overall value delivered and yeah. and making that high level connection and what we found at least on our side is that in the pre-sales motion a lot of times the buyers are different than the, than the oh, yeah. actual users and so yeah. And so if you do go that route, I think the caution would be around understanding that well and knowing that what presents itself post-sale is not necessarily what you can rely on pre-sales yeah. to get the job Good done. Point. Yeah, I, I think it, it's probably better for maybe some of your more complex products that take a long time to sell. So people are like, okay, we'll give it a whirl for six months and it's, you know, versus the like types of things where you're dropping JavaScript in and just going, going to town or something like that. A hundred percent. If you're, yeah. if you're in an environment for six months, you need to have some really, really detailed user perspective. And if they're not giving it to you on a, on a frequent basis, yeah. you better instrument it so that they're, you know, basically their fingers need to talk in uh, right. within your application as well. If you're, you're talking to a buyer, <laughs> it's way out of what we thought we were going to talk about. But like, if you're talking to a buyer, and they're like, great, I'm going to give this to my team and they're going to go use it. And they're going to tell me if this was good. And if they say they liked it, I'm going to go purchase it. Right. And then, but and then you're like, oh, I hope they start using it. Right. But like, or then I, I can see where then those factors can come into. So you can go back to the buyer and you're like, your team's not using this. And, you know, then present like if they did, you'd be able to save 30% or, you know, those types of things. So, but let's, we can stop talking about pre-sales. But... One, one last thing, Hold oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. want to hear a question, but like to sort of tie it all back though, I do think there is a really interesting perspective for, for the SaaS in general, who is trying to shorten sales cycles and trying to get people in the door quicker than, you know, traditionally they have. Absolutely. Done. If you can deploy in minutes, and Red Canary is one of those solutions that you can do that, right? Yeah. What you do is because most of the emphasis naturally within a company, and I say this like, 
I don't love this and I and I'm and I'm working to change this but but honestly like between you and I and everybody who ever listens to this like most of the in, like attention from the leadership level is going to be focused on the pre-sales sort of stage yeah if a sales engineer needs something to sell to a major customer it's going to happen it's going to jump to the top of the stack very quickly Absolutely. right yeah. but what happens is if you shorten that sales cycle and make it so easy to push those things push people into customers the emphasis on some of those things gets lost they then become customers who are giving you feedback through a VOC program mm -hmm. and and maybe they're not prioritized to the level that they should be unless right. you're really paying attention. And so that's another like super important role for CS and yeah. CS ops to play is to bring that commentary back into the forefront of the conversations internally and say, hey, there's a huge demand signal for this. And we may have missed it because because maybe we are killing it on the sales yeah. cycle side. Well, not only that, I love your perspective on that because the common problem I see is somebody signs up, let's say your average ARR is 50K, just to make things easier, right? Every customer, you average it out, it's 50K. Suddenly the 200K ARR customer signs up and everything they ask for suddenly gets escalated to the top. So I worked with somebody who did this great exercise of taking this uh, one feature that when you added up all of the customers that were asking for it, way above 200k but it was that 200k customer that like got the big spotlight that was able to kind of dictate everything and stuff like that so 100 percent hear what you're saying on that on those notes like oh it's just voc forget it we'll put it on this backlog which will never happen and stuff like that yeah absolutely every every new company needs to learn that hard lesson of changing how they do business for one specific customer and then having that one specific customer lead them Right. And then they're like, well, what do we do now? If you, you know, bring it back to baseball, like if you try and win every game by hitting the grand slam in the bottom of the ninth, it's, it's going to catch up to you. So absolutely. Okay, we have, a, we have a user question. We have, a, so, you know, shock to you, it wasn't passed to you beforehand. What are the key metrics tracked by CS Ops? Is it only related to churn or does it, also include metric around time to activation, usage, et cetera. Great question. Yes, the answer is yes. I guess I would say, I, you know, the standard answer is it depends, but it, it really, you can, you can sort of get better than that by saying this year, as long, you know, last year and this year with CS and CS ops, everybody's turning their attention to net revenue retention or annualized revenue of some sort and tying everything that we do as a CS team or as an ops team back to that that revenue. So to answer the question, like that's how we need to high level measure everything and have yeah. that constantly, like first and foremost in your mind, like how it is gonna affect that. Like customers with great long-term relationships that understand the value prop, always renew, they always expand. It's a big incentive to have them on your team when you're talking about NRR and you can directly correlate the work that you do in things like EBRs yeah. and and sync meetings and all of those things back to NRR. Yeah. And 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 so the it, from my perspective, you need to look at that stuff all and pull the thread all the way through back to that. And so the metric at a CS level or a CS ops level might be some sort of like number of EBR to customer ratio, taking EBR as an example, and then correlating that to likelihood of renewal, any kind of risk that comes up, time to resolution, and then ultimately their renewal and ups upsell expansion and how that ties into NRR. Yeah. But I think if it all ties back to that, to that overall company goal, I think that you're in good stead. So it could it could vary, like anything, you know, for for a B to C kind of business, it might be time in app or something right, like that, right. which yeah. which would also course that correspond back to those high level goals as well. So that's great. Does that answer it, or is it? No, no, that's, that's good. Forward? I actually had a, a follow on question along to that. Is is the it, it, the day to day interaction? Is are you working with individual CSs, CSMs on their book of business? or are you just kind of working in the background to make sure like the processes are available and like the dashboards are available to people so that they can just always go in and check what's going on? Or are you like, you know, classic movie scene running in with a, you know, laptop, like, oh my God, like this, <laughs> look at this data right here, you gotta go do something. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's much more of the latter, or no, I guess it was the former. 
People have been saying for quite some time that CSOps is basically becoming uh, a CSM to the CSMs within your company. Okay. Yep. So yep. as a CSM, if, if I don't if I don't work with individual CSMs on a daily basis, I'm not doing my job. Okay. Like I have a I have a very close relationship with the VP of CS. We work on the strategic things then to implement and make sure that it's working and also to make sure that our solutions and our processes aren't tone deaf and adding more right. overhead to the CSM than they should be in order to get the job done. I have to be constantly taking feedback from those CSMs and and it goes even further than that. Like ideally, m myself and my team sit in on actual customer calls and we look at actual customer issues and, and go through actual renewals with, with yeah. CSMs to really deeply understand how they work and the cool thing yeah the cool thing about ops is that it's not just that you get to then pivot and because we're in rev ops within customers within customer success yep. operations at red canary revenue operations is their blanket organization which sits in the middle between sales mm -hmm. and product and everything else yep. we get to then turn around and say okay we have these customers, but we also have these other larger customers within the organization. And how do we take the voice of CSM and sprinkle that data throughout the better or the bigger organization and influence how we make decisions as an organization about these really important right. things that we're about to do. Right. So it's it's incredibly like broad if you think about it in that perspective. Oh, no, that's fantastic. It, it's funny because you would not know this, uh, but like I had a post and like a, a chat with a company and I, I called it that CSMs are the, are the the Jan Brady's of the organization, but like you're arming the Jan so they can actually say like, I'm not just saying this, like it's really true. Right? <laughs> so it's too yeah. funny. Okay, we're, we're, this is a fascinating stuff and, and I, I'm trying not to sprinkle too much of my stuff in here because we're going to run out of time, but I did have an additional question. It, it comes out of your, I've got two, but uh, the one comes right out of your blog post. And you talked about, you know, there may be some time, point in time, excuse me, where where suddenly you're going to pass that data into like, you know, data scientists and, you know, have them really start putting the, the screws to the data and coming up with some, some stuff. Where do you where do you see that? Like, when does an organization get to that point where they're like, we got to bring in even bigger guns? Because you guys are the big guns, but let's, let's say even bigger guns. Yeah, I think you have to be as greedy as you possibly can about <laughs> <laughs> about yeah. your role and about how you handle it and 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 not really make that call until you absolutely need it in some aspects. In many places, you're going to have a data scientist or some sort of data expert that you can maybe lean on and ask questions off of. And until it becomes acute on the CS side, uh, you have questions that you can't answer given the data that you have, yeah. then, then you can get by for a very long time by yeah. DIYing it and leaning on other people. Or, or, or you let some data scientist build a product that, that you then just go use is sort of how I've been praying that it all works out. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and and again, it's the old the old thing there is that you can get into trouble using the tools that you you don't exactly know how they work all the way. So oh, that's yeah. the caution there. Yeah. But it's but for some organizations, it's just going to be a matter of logistics. Like I, if I have two hundred thousand customers in a B two C kind of like environment, I just can't use the tools that I have on hand to to process that. Yeah. And I'm probably, if I'm doing like what I should be doing, don't have time to go and learn those tools and implement them and be responsible for care and feeding of them and, mm -hmm. and data integrity and all of that stuff. So I'm going to need someone to help me with that. So yeah. it's probably going to come earlier for those companies that have, you know, web analytics kind of frameworks and, and yeah. doing things with like many millions, maybe customers and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, I thousand percent agree. I actually have data to back that up because I was at a company called Bridge and Pulse, which had a web product. And then also everybody was wearing like a Fitbit type of tracker. You can imagine all the data that's coming in and, it, and we, there was no tool you needed to pass all of this usage data after it was de-identified, of course, into, into data scientists' hands so they can come up with these insights. Okay, so 
last question and i understand if you need to be generic and talk about the type of product instead of saying like these are the actual vendors that you're using but like what's your current stack right now like what, what are the tools or types of tools that you're using i will also as i've probably said in like 15 podcasts already like vlookup is the biggest bi tool in the world but yeah. uh <laughs> no doubt we, we we definitely use google sheets to a great extent but less and less more so uh these days and it's because we have uh, a much more robust stack coming to the to the fight if you will with respect to all of this customer telemetry so so for us our foundation is and always will be salesforce in order mm -hmm. to be our system of record for everything that customers do our crm and we also have our own, I will throw in our application or our customer portals that, that generate all of this. Right. Uh, I mean, a good majority of this uh, customer telemetry. Because we're a security operation, we don't, we don't want those things to come together ever. And so we sit a, a, a very specific uh, customer success uh, software in between those two things. I'll just say it's Churn Zero. Well, okay, we've been yeah. a customer of theirs for uh, coming up on five years now, yes. and and we we gather telemetry from our application within that tool, and then when appropriate, we will make the connection back to Salesforce. And so it sort of regulates between the two mm -hmm. of those things. We also have Zendesk handling all of our customer support activity mm -hmm. that's piped into Churn Zero as well. So for more telemetry, more indicators of of good, bad, and ugly. And then we have product board that provides feedback for, or direct from customers, but also from CSMs and yep. everybody else in the company who's that's product that's customer. I remember you talking about that on the GDR, and I was blown away by how cool of a product that sounded like. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And so we sort of tie all that together, and that's it, really. Uh, C yeah. uh, Cut Turn Zero handles surveys, so we don't have a specific survey tool. They handle our journeys and and our our plays. They also do all of our risk scoring and our health scoring. I mean, they don't do it. The tool yeah. does it based on our prescription. It's it's incredibly flexible and powerful, and it does things like export to Google Sheets in a live way that allows us to MVP dashboards and products that we would for the rest of the company with customer-specific data involved in this as well. Fantastic. Well, wow. lots of great insights. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll, like, we'll grab you back in a year or so and see what's, what's been updated. I have been sort of ending some of these with saying like, what was your big activity for COVID, which is like now kind of back. So like just baking bread. I see a banjo in the background. What's, what's, what's the, what's going on? It's just for looks like most banjos on the planet. Like that one just sits there and collects dust. Um, I had a guitar behind me for a while. I had to move them over here because there's ping pong tables there, but now <laughs> I got you. Make sure, look cool. Make sure they look a lot cooler than us guitar players because like, the banjo's a lot cooler, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it might be the first time I've ever heard someone say the banjo was cooler than the guitar, but I'll take it, right? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> for us... Make it look super cool. Like yeah. I got one of those collecting dust too. For me specifically, I, I'm a girl dad times three, so I have three little girls. My wife and I are incredibly busy with those yep. three. We, you know, been stuck inside in COVID for so long. We really try to get out of the house over, yeah. over this last break and just explore and do some things that to push our boundaries a little bit. And we were mostly successful with yeah. that. We talked about that before we got on, so that was, it was, that was a great story. So that's awesome. Well, listen, uh, David, hold on. I'm going to stop the recording. We'll just catch up on a couple of logistics and uh, we're good. But thanks so much for joining. I'm sure it's going to be super helpful for everybody that's listened. And we'll, uh, we'll hit stop right about now. Awesome.